I spent about uh, uh, a third of my early career in uh, pediatric emergencies. So it is something that you get more comfortable with the more you kind of do it. Let's hit on a little of the things that uh, pediatrics, because you can't have a pediatric lecture without talking about how different and weird they are. But they are all human. The thing to think about this little human is uh, what causes him and his ilk to become injured. It's not real common. Serious injury, you know, kids hurt themselves all the time. That's true. If you have a kid, you know that that thing is just, it's just trying to hurt itself. That's what it lives for. It's like a hamster. If it's not trying to injure itself, it doesn't know what it's doing. Thankfully, serious injury in kids is pretty rare. Uh, death as a result of trauma is pretty rare per kid, uh, per capita. The rate is pretty rare, but it is essentially one of the reasons that kids die. Um, you know, when it starts off, you have all the complications of birth, and then you have SIDS, and once you're big enough to kind of get out of a crib and start moving around a little bit, uh, the most common reason that kids get seriously injured or die, at least in trauma, is, uh, is from falls. Uh, once they start to ride bikes, it becomes bikes. Once they start to drive, it becomes cars. And by the time they start to drive, also you throw in there things like intentional um, injury as a result of you know, suicide attempts and that kind of stuff, and uh, drugs. <clears throat> and, and those are the reasons that kids die from you know, trauma or trauma-like things, generally speaking. We do have to mention children's anatomy. The thing to think about with children, at least to kind of keep in mind, because everybody, again, wants you to say it, if you look at this, uh, these children, aren't they so cute? They're adorable. Um, <clears throat> if you look at their bodies and you like grab one and you know, give it a big bear hug, you find they're fairly squishy in that they are not completely ossified for most of their skeletons. So a lot of their bones, bones, joints, that kind of stuff still have a lot of cartilage. They tend to bend and break a little bit rather than just like, you know, snap in half like an adult does. But that also means that their ribs are not uh, all that protective. They tend not to have rib fractures. They just kind of squeeze their chests in and they get lung contusions and that kind of stuff. Less pneumothoraces, more contusions, that kind of thing. The other thing that folks like to talk about is the size of their heads. And, you know, look at this monster head here. Oh my God, it's so huge. Um, <clears throat> likewise with this guy, and he's, he's a little bit older in this picture, uh, and these are two different kids. Um, but they both have really big heads, and they both kind of wobble around like this with this giant melon perched on top of this little tiny stick body. When they fall over, you just intentionally, uh, or you just by nature, tend to lead with their heads because that's the biggest thing in their top head, and they go, pew, boop. So, uh, kids do have a uh, relatively high frequency of head injury, but again, most of the time, just a fall, uh, they're going to be okay. That's all you need to know about Pete's trauma. No, I'm just kidding. So, do we have some trauma updates in pediatrics? Is there anything new and hot? What's out there? We hear about adults all the time in the EMS side because we tend to like adults. We don't tend to like kids or dealing with kids. So, is there something that we need to know new about kids? Let's ask that question. Um, what is the update? Well. I think what we're finding more and more is that, uh, as I've said, kids are adults, but little. Take that, pediatricians. Um, wh why do I say that? Uh, we find that the stuff in trauma that tends to be good for adults seems to be good for kids with, with maybe a few exceptions here. And uh, let's get into that a little bit. So for instance, TXA. Some question for some time, you know, TXA, not really lots of studied in, in PEDS specifically. Is it good? Uh, does it help? We have some studies recently that seem to show that TXA does seem to be good in pediatrics. When you had, um, this was, this happened to be in like a combat situation. This, uh, you know, where else you're going to get a bunch of kids that are bleeding uh, that you can actually study them in, a, in this kind of environment. Um, but in kids that got uh, TXA, mortality was lower than kids that didn't get TXA when they were getting a lot of blood. Um, <clears throat> when it came out there that it's stuff that you need, then kids that got TXA seem to do better. Now, it's worth noting this is, you know, kind of observational and it's not a great trial. And the p-value for this that says, is there actually a difference? And this looks like a pretty big old difference, but is the, uh, is the difference real? It doesn't quite hit that statistical significance. Uh, that's true, 0 0.055, which means that instead of a 95% chance that this is a real finding, that the difference is real, uh, it's 94.5, which is 
still pretty close, but yes, it doesn't quite hit that statistically significant thing, but that seems to be a big thing, and there doesn't seem to be a big problem or danger to given TXA. So evidence is kind of pushing it there, and I'm going to say that this is probably the best evidence we're going to get, uh, at least anytime soon. So we should probably just go ahead and give TXA in, uh, in kids, is my opinion, although, you know, caveat in there. Uh, what else do we know about bleeding kids? There's some question for some time, you know, about blood transfusions, and, and the thing is that kids are, kids are good little clotters, so, like, uh, does it matter if you give them, honestly, saline versus, or um, uh, resuscitation fluid crystalloid, does it matter if you give them that versus blood kind of right up front if they don't need a ton? Um, that is, is still probably up for debate, at least in what you should be using the whole time. <clears throat> um, We'll still say limit crystalloid, and I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, what about in kids that have a lot of bleeding? They get massive transfusion protocols. Does giving a product, blood product like uh, plasma in a balanced fashion, meaning you get a thing, hit a red cells, hit a plasma, hit a red cells, hit a plasma uh, altogether, or giving whole blood or something like that, is there evidence to say that kids do better with that? Because there is evidence to say probably that adults do much better with that. Does the same thing hold for kids? The answer is yes. Um, that balanced transfusion, just like in adults, seems to be good for kids. So giving, if you're going to give, you know, 10 mLs per kilo of red cells, then give 10 mLs per kilo of plasma with it. Uh, and that seems to be good. Now, now again, maybe there's some question about whether or not they tolerate uh, or they need that much fluid, whether there's a big difference if they don't have like a ton of bleeding or ongoing bleeding. But certainly in the massive transfusion, if you are out there and you have your hands on some blood, they probably should get blood in a, uh, a balanced fashion, meaning again, one unit of plasma, one unit of red cells, throw in some platelets in there probably as well at some point. And there's not that many more updates, but this was one that I wanted to point out. Uh, this is relatively hot off the press. This is an evidence-based guideline for airway management. And this is not specifically PEDS, but they make PEDS recommendations in there. Uh, it's for adults and pediatrics. And without belaboring the point too much, they make two recommendations I want to point out. And this is, uh, again, this is a big group. This is something that you can take to the bank, and it's a well-done evidence-based guideline. Uh, we can talk about that at some other point, about what makes a good EBG. But they make this recommendation. I'll just read it so I don't mess it up. Recommendation 10, we suggest that either ventilation with BVM alone or ETI, under tracheal intubation, may be used in airway management for pediatric patients with trauma, which is a conditional recommendation, meaning we're going to say some stuff with it that, like, uh, there's caveats to that. And also, we're not the certainty of evidence is very low on that. Folks may look at that and say, ha, told you. Look, this group is saying that we can intubate these kids and we don't just have to bag them. And don't, Walt, don't take away intubation from us. Um, we should be able to intubate these kids. Look at the guideline. And it's important to point out that, yes, that is the recommendation they make. But the reason they make that recommendation is because there's just not evidence, there's not a good study to say one way or the other. However, they do want to throw in there, and I'll just read it, while the existing literature is insufficient to make anything other than a neutral recommendation saying, we, we think you can do either, um, <clears throat> supporting either BVM ventilation or ETI, the panel does have significant reservations about this neutral recommendation being misconstrued as an endorsement of endotracheal intubation in, the, in this patient population. This is decidedly not the intent of the panel. In fact, the panel believes that ETI in children is extremely challenging. The potential benefits are likely outweighed by the potential pitfalls. So, sorry guys, you don't have, in the pre-hospital setting, we do not have a strong recommendation and probably, while they can't, because they're being honest, they can't say with evidence that you shouldn't be intubating these kids uh, rather than bagging them. They do say uh, that we don't think, even though we have to say we can't say one way or the other, we don't think this is probably a good idea. Uh, and that you probably should do something other than intubating. Because intubating kids is hard, and we'll hit on it in a second. They make another recommendation, too, um, and this is a little bit more clear. We suggest in favor of supraglottic airway over ETI in airway management for pediatric patients with trauma. Uh, again, conditional recommendation, low certainty of evidence. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Uh, we, we have at least guidelines that say, well, yes, you could intubate them, and uh, if you truly go by the evidence base, there's not something to say you shouldn't, but it's fairly clear that we probably, fairly clear to me at least, that the standard of care 
is going away from intubation and will not be intubation for very long. Um, we just can't say it right this moment. But what should you be doing? Let's be real. You should be putting in a supraglottic airway. You should have pediatric sizes of your supraglottic airway of choice, whether that's a king, and there's you know some things about kings right now, but at least an eye gel, or if you're doing the LMA stuff, then the LMA. You should probably not be intubating kids unless you are really, really good at it and have a lot of experience in it. And anymore, I'll be honest, I don't have a lot of experience in it. It's been a while since I've intubated a kid. I can't, I can't say that I really ever had like true bunches of experience. It was always a hair raising thing, but I could kind of, you know, I at least know enough about it, I could get myself out of trouble. I think most of us, any of us that say in the pre-hospital setting, if we're paramedics, that we are good to intubate kids, no you're not. Um, I hate, it. And unless you work for a pediatric transport service that does it all the time, all the rest of us, no we're not, we're just, we're just not. And we should get away from intubating kids or trying to intubate kids. Um, we, we can play supraglottic airways great. We can bag really well. We don't need to do the endotracheal intubation stuff, truly. And that's a little bit of editorializing, but, um, but I thought I'd throw it in there. All right, now that I've made everybody mad and I don't have a friend in the world, let's talk about some other stuff that is not an update, but maybe just stuff that you need to know about pediatric trauma or things that I've learned over the years about managing pediatric trauma. One thing that's important that we are increasingly becoming more popular with or that folks are accepting a bit more probably is that uh, patients get cold. Everybody gets cold. Kids get cold fast. Uh, think of it like this. If you had a four ounce, you know, filet, uh, a steak, four ounce steak that you heated up to 150 degrees and a 20 ounce porterhouse that you heated up to 150 degrees and you plopped them both on the counter, which one gets colder faster? It's of course the little four ounce filet. It's got a higher surface area to volume ratio. There's less mass that has to cool off. Kids are the same way. Kids are the little four ounce steak. I'm the porterhouse. It's going to take a while for me to lose all my heat. It does not take a kid very long to lose uh, enough heat to make them significantly hypothermic. And anytime somebody gets injured, kids, adults, whoever, your body temperature, if you get severely injured, starts to trend pretty quickly toward ambient temperature. It's hot in this room right now. We're all kind of sweating a little bit. The temperature's probably 74, 75 degrees. If I cut my leg off and hemorrhage to a significant degree and go into shock, my body temperature is going to tend toward 75 degrees, which is too cold for Walt to be alive, even though it's, it feels really warm in here. Kids get cold fast. You have to keep them warm, and you should limit the amount of um, cold fluid that you give them too, because again, every little bit that you put in there cold, quit that, cools them off that much faster. Some things to think about with head injuries, because again, head injuries are pretty common in kids. Most of them are thankfully not severe, but the injuries that are severe to kids usually revolve around the head uh, for various reasons. The things to keep in mind when you're dealing with a child with a bad head injury, and let's just call it a bad traumatic brain injury, things to keep in mind that are going to keep them good or help them survive with as good neurologic function as you can is normoxia, normal tension, and normovolemia. We want to keep them normal, which means all the stuff you've been taught about, like hyperventilate these kids and uh, get their blood pressure up, uh, or maybe don't get their blood pressure up, and uh, give them plenty of oxygen, put oxygen on them. He's injured, right? He needs oxygen. Don't do that stuff. You want the kid to have a normal oxygen sat, not 100%, somewhere between 94 and 100. You want them to have normal bulimia, meaning not hypertensive, not hypotensive. Don't give them a ton of fluid if they don't need it. And you want the kid to have um, normal end tidal CO2, which we'll throw in there as well. And you may say, well, uh, you know, I, I hyperventilated him because he has a head injury and he's acting weird. What's hyperventilation do? Mild hyperventilation, you know, let's get his sat, and by the way, that's get his end title down to 30, between 30 and 35, not get his end title down to 25. Lower is not better. Get it between 30 and 35. Why do we do that? We do that in folks that have increased intracranial pressure that are in danger of herniating. The pressure in their head is so great that we think the <clears throat> better treatment would be to temporarily blow off some of their CO2, which causes their 
uh, blood vessels in their head to vasoconstrict, which takes up less space, which decreases pressure for at least a short period of time. The problem with that is that when the blood vessels constrict, that's less blood flow going through your head. And so you've got an injured brain with less blood flow to it, which doesn't seem ideal to start off with. But also, it's not of benefit if they're not about to herniate. And it's not a benefit for very long. And it's just a temporary thing. So do not hyperventilate most of these kids. Uh, what is it? It's if the kid is unresponsive and posturing or has a blown pupil or two. Those are signs that you should probably be hyperventilating this kid. Everybody else, uh, you know, all things aside, otherwise, that they're not in hemorrhagic shock or something, aim for an end title of 35 to 40, not 30 to 35. Only go to 30 to 35 if they seem to have that ICP stuff. Okay? It is more complicated than that. We could talk about it for a while, but that's all I'm going to say for right at the moment. One thing that we do want to mention here is that when you give these kids fluid, if you give them fluid, if they have a bad traumatic brain injury, you probably want to give them isotonic fluid, i.e., not hypotonic fluid. Why do I point that out? Because if you ask me any other time, what fluid should we be given to kids, adults, old people, young people, it's not going to be normal saline. That's what I'm going to say. If the person needs fluid, don't give them normal saline um, <clears throat> because there's a bunch of bad stuff that happens with it. And again, I've got a whole lecture. Check it out. It's pretty cool. The problem with given LR, which is what most of us have, which is a balanced solution, Lactated ringer solution is a little bit hypotonic. It's got a little more water in it than it does solutes. And theoretically, if you throw that up around the patient's brain, if you let their brain bathe in that, their brain will soak up that extra water just through osmosis. And that will cause increased swelling, or that's the concern anyway. So we try not to give hypotonic solutions like LR to patients with known bad TBI. Now, if it's what you got, it's what you got. And it's not that big a deal, and you're not given that much of it to start off with. But if we can do something different, this is the time when maybe a little bag of saline on the ambulance is not a, not a terrible idea to have as an option. You could also give hyperosmolar solutions. There's you know, some thought that maybe we should just give everybody 3% saline as our resuscitation fluid. It's not really the, you know, the acid that folks kind of think it is. And it is safe. We, have, we do have a recent study that shows that it's actually safe. It's perfectly safe to give through a peripheral IV. Um, <clears throat> Again, what's the indication for hypertonic saline, though? Really, it's to decrease intracranial pressure that happens as a result of edema or hemorrhage. And the reason you would do that is if the person appears to be, um, appears to have impending cerebral herniation. So they're unconscious and they've got a blown pupil or two blown pupils. Or they're unconscious and they're posturing, meaning they're going like that or they're going like that. That's the indication for it. <clears throat> uh, for hyperosmolar therapy, 3% saline, hot salt, whatever you want to call it. All right. How about the cervical spine while we're talking about neurological stuff? You know, C-spine. Uh, God, you'll hear me say it every time. BSI scene safe. Consider C-spine number of uh, all kind of jazz that you get trained to say. And so somebody like jumps on there and holds on their neck. And then because it's a four-year-old kid who is just crying and won't talk to us or uh, because it's a two-year-old kid who can't talk, then like, uh, or it's because it's a uh, uh, Hispanic child that doesn't speak English, we immediately jump on. We're like, well, he's got to have a C-collar. And then we like wrestle this C-collar on this kid that never fits. It never does. Um, <clears throat> Do all these kids need spinal immobilization when they fall because how can I check their neck? Well, again, you have to be kind of a person that believes that a seat collar actually does something uh, in order to make any of this kind of work. But what does the national recommendation say? There is still this paper that's out there from NAMSP about spinal motion restriction. And when they talk about kids specifically, they do say that age alone shouldn't be the factor and that uh, communication barriers don't necessarily mandate spinal motion restriction. So if he broke his leg, but he seems just fine from every place else, you don't have to put him in a seat collar or tie him down to a backboard. God, don't tie him down to a backboard. Jesus. <clears throat> but age alone is not a criteria. Communication barriers are not necessarily a criteria for it. What's the real thing that you know, lets you know if a kid's got a spine injury? Well, it's either they've got a neurological deficit, or they have pain, or they won't move their neck or their back. Kids are great at that. They may not tell you um, that they are injured in a way, but if a kid is not moving a part of their body, 
that part is injured. If they're willing to go like this and do that kind of thing, and you're like, look over this way, and the kid goes, Mur? and then you say, look over here, and he goes, Mur? and you know, his head turns around 360 degrees, that kind of thing. That's a kid that really probably doesn't have a spine injury. I've never seen a kid with a spine injury that, uh, that has that. Spine injuries are, by the way, exceptionally rare in children to start off with. But how do we clear a kid from a cervical spine standpoint until you show up in the ER and they're like, oh, he hasn't been imaged, get a collar on it. Oh, God almighty. We can only do what we can do. Um, how do you clear a kid? If the kid is not drunk, distracted, or confused, meaning they have normal mental status and they're not under, uh, you know, not, again, intoxicated or something like that, which kids do get, and they don't have pain, tenors, or neurological deficit, just like in adults, and they can turn their head, they don't have torticollis, and it wasn't a high-risk mechanism like dove into a two-foot deep pool and, you know, pile-drived onto their neck, then they don't need spinal motion restriction. You can safely just take that kid to the emergency department. And again, could they have some sort of injury? Maybe. But is there any evidence that says the C-collar actually does anything? Nope. Not at all. So even if you've got a kid with a spine injury, while folks will look at you weird and uh, may criticize you for it, is there actually any evidence base that says it helps? Not actually. Just keep the kid still. Don't drop him. Don't dangle his head off the back of the bed. Um, <clears throat> and definitely, in the, if they meet these criteria, they don't need a seat collar. By the way, while in adults, they're like, oh man, if he's got tenderness in one area, he could have a spine injury in some other area. So if you immobilize part of him, you got to immobilize the rest of him. So you can't just put a seat collar on him. You got to put him on the backboard. And you got to do all this other stuff. Uh, even though he's only got pain like right here in this one spot, this whole thing could be injured because there could be another injury in there. They do at least say there's no evidence for multi-level non-contiguous injury in kids. So just because you put the collar on him doesn't mean that he has to like be on the backboard and in the little peony mate thing and all that kind of stuff if he meets all the other criteria. That's what this says. Um, and it is fine, by the way, to pad underneath the child's shoulders. Why? Because little kids have, again, big noggins, big occiputs, uh, and a lot back there that causes their head to rock forward. So you want to put some padding underneath them to keep their spine, or to keep their cervical spine actually in a neutral alignment. Otherwise, they're going to be flexed. And it's uncomfortable with the kid, they can't breathe all that well, and, and it's just bad. So pad underneath them uh, so that their head is uh, in a neutral position. <clears throat> How about needle decompression in a kid? Uh, pneumothoraces are relatively rare in children, definitely compared to the frequency in adults. And again, why? Probably because their little rib cages are flexible and they don't just like bust ribs and cause little tears and stuff. Uh, they tend to just squish uh, like sponges. And so they get bad pulmonary contusion, but pneumothorax is thankfully not all that common. If you did have a pneumothorax, you could needle decompress it though. How would you do it? Same place as an adult. Uh, and if you have high suspicion, especially the child's in arrest, uh, while I would make the case that maybe the finger thoracostomy is the better move if the child's in car uh, traumatic cardiac arrest and you want to make sure that they don't have a pneumothorax, that's the way to go. But anyway, uh, what would you do? You take your good sized needle and you can just use a big 10 gauge, uh, but a 12 or even a 14 in a smaller child, uh, like toddler size, is probably actually going to be sufficient. Go second inner space and go the bend of the clavicle, which is, again, lateral. It's, it's not in the middle. Go lateral. Uh, or you can go lateral, uh, truly lateral, between the anterior axillary line and the mid-axillary line. That's the fourth or fifth inner space. And again, be careful here because it's not down here. It's, it's up. It's pretty darn close. If you look at, like, nipple line, especially in a child, um, <clears throat> it's, it's a lot closer to the axilla than you would think it probably is. So don't go down and get a liver biopsy, which is, you know, fairly, uh, fairly common. And remember that kids' diaphragms do tend to ride up fairly high. Um, so in this case, probably better to go a little on the upper side than on the lower. But I think personally that this is a good opportunity to do second inner space, uh, in my opinion. They just don't have that much tissue up here. You'll be able to get in. What about crystalloid resuscitation? Mentioned this a little bit uh, before. Can you give these kids, uh, should you limit crystalloid? We think we should limit crystalloid in adults because it's not blood and they're not bleeding salt water, they're bleeding blood. And when you give non-blood back to them in high volumes, then that tends to make things a bit worse. But uh, can we give crystalloid? 
Yeah, it's okay in kids. Kids are a little bit more uh, voracious clotters. They're a bit better. They tolerate boluses of crystalloid better than adults do. Um, again, in adults, we really try to limit it. We say permissive hypotension. Let them get hypotensive as long as they've got a radio pulse and their mental status is okay. They can be a little hypotensive or at least down to 90 without reaching for the fluid if that's all you got, and certainly blood's better. Kids, um, while we should do probably the same thing, it is okay to give them fluid. It's a bit more okay to give them fluid. 20 ml per kilo bolus, uh, certainly. Things to kind of keep in mind. Again, kids, young, healthy, and good clotters, kids will not manifest that they are really, really sick until they're just about at the end. If you think they're bleeding and they've got altered mental status, that's a kid that should get a bolus of maybe blood but fluid, uh, if nothing else. And the other thing that kind of goes in there is by the time the kid actually gets hypotensive, then that is a kid that's really sick because they don't get hypotensive until they're really to die. If they are hypotensive, that's a real, real sick kid. And yes, blood would be ideal, but it is okay to give them some fluid. They tolerate that a whole lot better than, uh, than adults do. And that's again 20 mLs per kilo, and then start giving them blood after that. But a little bit of a little bit of LR is actually okay in kids. They they just they tolerate it a little bit better. Um, again, which which one are we going for here? Generally speaking, outside of TBI, um, you should probably not be giving a bunch of saline, and probably should be giving a balanced solution like lactated ringers or uh, plasma or something like that. Um, LR is going to be the better choice for most of us here. And the only time when I would really think differently is, again, in TBI, or if we, I know that they're super hyponatremic, and then it may do something else. But that's not going to be most of us. If I had to pick one, I would say just go with the LR because it's going to be good most of the time. And kind of that's it. Again, most of the time, kids, they get injured. They get injured all the time. They hurt themselves all the time. Um, but the chance that they're going to die from their injuries is relatively low. But when you see them, and they are severely injured, you can treat them pretty close to what we would do with adults. Just remember, again, if they are hypotensive, super sick. If their mental status is off, pretty sick. Um, and okay to give fluids to them. The rest kind of goes about the same, except don't worry about intubating them. Bag them, superglottic airway them. Those are the big kind of updates and things to kind of think about. TXA, good. Balanced solutions, good. Balanced resuscitation with blood and plasma, and at some, at some point platelets, also good. Let's talk pediatric resuscitation. Not trauma necessarily. What happens when you've got a super sick kid or a arrested kid? Um, it tends to be hard for us because we've been taught kids are not small adults, they're different. Well, we're used to taking care of adults and adult humans and like, well, what, what are they different exactly then? And we get this in our mind, and I understand why folks say it, but I think that the counter argument to that is uh, something that my friend Jeremy Yurik, who said, when we were talking about pediatric resuscitation, like, I'll talk about pediatric resuscitation. You want me to talk about that? Yeah, cool. They don't mean anything to me. It's, it's milliliters coming out of a vial, my friend. I don't care how old or how young you are. And that's a good way to kind of think about it. As I've kind of said for years, kids are, they're little adults. Sure they are. Um, <clears throat> sometimes mean little adults. Often they're adults that have other adults with them that are very concerned about them. More so than they would be about themselves, but it's a little bit different. The thing is, kids are basically the same as the rest of us. This, while this kid uh, is, you know, smaller, He's got a heart, he's got a brain, he's got lungs. Fundamentally, the things that keep him alive are the same things that keep me alive. You know, bad jokes just like the rest of us. I don't think we got to get real wrapped up in this idea that they're not small adults, because every time you say they're not small adults, that just, while folks, uh, you know, we do it to raise attention to the differences in kids, that tends to just kind of scare folks, I thought. Kids are... Kids, kids are humans. They're like the rest of us. Uh, it's, if you treat my kid like a small version of me, I'm okay with that, as long as you do a good job about it. Kids are small adults. The elderly are old adults. People with HIV are adults with bad immune systems. People with cancer are adults that 
clot more and have space occupying things and that kind of stuff. Everybody, every group out there is not just a small adult. But if we get into that, then we're like, oh my God, well now I'm not ready. Ah. Let's just make it simple. Kids are small adults. You can treat them. The stuff that's good for an adult, generally good for a kid. Uh, we're all people. We've got basically the same physiology. And I'm, you know, I know the pediatricians are mad at me right now, but you know what? Come give this lecture then. Anyway, <laughs> air, kids and adults. Air goes in and out. Blood goes round and round. The brain needs oxygen and glucose. And if any of that is disordered, then uh, you've got a problem, whether you're an adult or a child. Let's just leave it at that. Now, in kids, the dosing is different than in adults. And for most of our drugs, it probably should be a little bit different in adults too, depending on their size, but we just don't do it to make it easier. In kids, maybe it's a little bit more important. We can figure out ways to make that work though. Um, dosing etomidate in an adult is a pain in the butt. Absolutely. I try and figure out 0.3 or if I'm going to do a sedative like 0.15 or doing uh, 1.2 milligrams per kilogram of uh, rock uranium. Trying to figure that out. Yes, I understand that's hard, but it's just kind of part of it. It's just a thing that we do and there's ways that we can kind of get around it. One thing I'd like to mention with the dosing stuff, and this is, this is probably a hard and fast rule, you don't have to remember everything. You probably don't have to remember most things. You've almost always got time to look up stuff. Uh, it's very, very rare that you truly do not have a second to pull out a, an app or something and check your work and, and make sure that your dose is right. There's the occasional ones that you probably do have to know. These are the ones that I commit to memory. So epi, 0.01, this is kids, 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. And don't memorize the mls per kilogram. Um, you're not giving mls. I could give uh, the same dose of epi in 10 milliliters of solution or in one milliliter of solution or in a half a milliliter of solution. Solution, the volume is not the dose. Just remember the dose and then you can figure it out based on what you got in front of you because the next time that we have a drug shortage comes along and they're like, we don't have the glass to make concentrated epi vials anymore, then you're gonna have to switch and it's gonna be all screwed up. So just remember the dose. It's 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Atropine, which we don't use in adults much anymore, uh, but we do use in kids sometimes, 0.02 milligrams per kilogram. Fluid comes in 20 ml per kilogram boluses. Those are basically the things you have to remember. Blood, less common for us out in the field, but still out there, comes in 10 ml per kilo boluses. A unit of blood in a kid, or a dose of blood in a kid, is 10 milliliters per kilogram. Dextrose, uh, depending on what you have, you know, D blank times whatever the dose is, always um, goes out to 50. So, what do I say here? If I have D50 and I'm giving it to a kid, and I'm not saying you should, but if I did, D50, giving it to a kid, I'm going to give 1 ml per kilo. So 50 times 1 equals 50. If I got D25, 25 times 2 milliliters per kilogram gives you 50. If I got D10, which would be my preference for pretty much everybody, adult and kids, D10 times 5 mls per kilogram gets you 50. And if I got D5, 5 times 10 gives you 50. So, sorry, that's 10 times 5 milliliters per kilogram uh, for D10. If you got D5, it's uh, like you got a little neonate or something like that, then it's 5 times 10 milliliters per kilogram. It, it um, <clears throat> multiplies out to 50. Cool? Makes sense? And then there's naloxone, the other thing that you might need to know kind of right offhand. Um, the dose of naloxone in a, in a kid, 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Or you could give 10 times that. Or you could give a tenth of that and, and you just titrate to effect. Who knows? It, it is, the, giving more of it doesn't really make a difference. Naloxone is one of those things like, all right, he got some. Uh, if he got better, cool. Otherwise, still bagging him, still maintaining the other way. The dose of naloxone, kind of unknown, uh, but doesn't really matter that much. You could give 0.4 and to every kid and start off there, and that'd be fine too. <clears throat> Few things you got to remember about airway management, uh, at least in terms of the numbers. What size tube do you use? It's age over four plus four. So if I got a four-year-old uh, that I'm intubating for whatever reason, not again that I necessarily would recommend it in the field, but I got age over four, so four over four, 
gives us one plus four. I'm going to use a 5-0 tube. Uh, if I'm using a cuff tube, I'll usually back off that by about uh, one half of a tube size. So instead of a 5-0 tube, do a 4.5. Same thing would go with, you know, a six. Uh, six over four is 1.5 plus four. That gives me five and a half. I'm using a 5-5 tube. Um, you know, once they get to be about eight, then you're getting into the adult sizes, the six, the sevens, that kind of stuff. The depth of the tube is going to be three times the um, tube size. So if I'm using a size four tube, I'm going to put it at 12 centimeters at the gum slash lip, something like that. I'm going to put it at 12. And then the NG tube size is double the ET tube size. So if I'm using a size 40 tube, then I would use a size a uh, eight French OG or uh, NG tube. Uh, to put down afterwards. A little bit less likely that you're probably going to run into that particular scenario, but it's out there. Push dose epi. Let me get rid of myself here for just a second because I think the slide is important to look at. Push dose epi, if you want to confuse people, um, <clears throat> then uh, tell them to make up some push dose epi for a kid. There's a couple of different ways you can do this. They all kind of work out the same. Here's what I would tell you to do. I would take and a rest dose of epi for the child, that's 0.01 milligrams per kilogram, and draw that up, however way you're going to do it. And I would draw it up into a 10 cc syringe, 10, mil, 10 milliliter syringe. I would then take some saline and draw as much saline as it takes to get to 10 milliliters in that syringe up with it and then give it a shake around. And then I would give one to two milliliters of that uh, every, you know, two to five minutes, something like that. And that ultimately gives us a dose of one microgram per kilogram uh, every, you know, two minutes thereabouts, or a half every minute, which is a reasonable, like, epi-infusion dose. What have you actually done here? Because I just kind of described this thing. What I've done is taken a code dose of epi, and what does putting it into the 10 cc syringe and then drawing up the saline behind it do? It lets you give a tenth of that dose of epi. Say that again. We take our code dose of epi, and the whole idea is just to basically give a tenth of that dose. So that's why we put it in the syringe and then fill it up with saline behind it, so we can easily give a tenth of a code dose of epi every two to five minutes. You know, a, a, Point, a, a milliliter or two milliliters, a tenth or two tenths, something like that. And again, is there a lot behind it that says that that has to be that dose and that if you get a little bit off that you're okay? Now, it wouldn't be a hundred times off, but ten times off is okay. So again, one more time with feeling. Take epinephrine, draw up into a 10 cc syringe the volume that you would use to get a code dose of epi for that child. Then fill the rest of the syringe up to 10, till the whole volume in the syringe is 10, fill that up with saline, and then give a milliliter or two milliliters of that every two to five minutes, uh, titrate to desired effect. Cool? If you're following Southwest Ohio Protocol, and again, I get, get myself out of the way here for just a second, Southwest Ohio Protocol specifies that, and it says it a little differently, but what you're going to do is basically the same. It says give them one microgram per kilogram of a 10 mic per ml solution every two to five minutes. So what they're saying is take epi, like you, push dose epi like you would have made it already for an adult, you know, one, uh, one milligram of epi in a 100 ml bag of saline. Um, <clears throat> take that and then draw up enough that you're giving a mic per kilogram uh, of that every two to five minutes. What's that will look like volume wise? It means of that solution, of that push dose epi solution that you make, that you're gonna give 0.1 ml per kilogram uh, every uh, two to five minutes, thereabouts. Ultimately, this works out to be essentially the same dose. Um, <clears throat> but I like the way that I told you to do it a little bit better because it's a little bit clearer to me. I'm gonna, again, take the code dose, Put, it, put that dose in a 10 cc syringe, fill the rest of the syringe up to 10 with saline, and then give a milliliter or two of that every two to five minutes. Hopefully, that's kind of clear. Do it either way. Otherwise, everything else you got on you, by the way, uh, you can use a hand heavy, uh, you can use a Braslow tape for it. Everybody that is doing hand heavy likes it. Uh, I've never actually used it myself, can't speak to it. 
either one works. Either one is okay, just kind of know how to use it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, whatever you like, whatever works for your service, like cool, do that. But definitely don't memorize the rest of this stuff. Don't memorize the dose of amiodarone for a child or the dose of, uh, uh, well maybe lorazepam, but don't, don't memorize diazepam or something like that. Um, or what size LMA you would use and that kind of stuff. This, that can all be written down. That doesn't need to take up space in your brain. Use an app, use a piece of paper that's got it written on it or something like that. All right. Now we're chilling here. Little adults don't arrest for the same reason as big adults. And that's true. Uh, and maybe something to keep in mind as you go. This is probably the one big fundamental change that you might make a difference on. What's that mean? Well, when you look at why kids arrest, uh, why do kids die outside the hospital, in this particular study, uh, you look at the reasons for it. The number one was submersion. They drowned, which is pretty common. Um, or they had SIDS or they had some sort of respiratory thing. Those are the top three. You notice none of that is like the adult presumption of death, which is cardiac arrhythmia, and that's what we base all of our ACLS treatment on. Um, this seems to be all airway stuff. Submersion, SIDS, we don't know about SIDS, who knows. Uh, submersion, respiratory stuff, uh, or unknown. That's potentially all airway stuff, rather than primary heart stuff, because kids tend to have reasonable tickers. When you look at the presenting rhythm for kids, depending on what study you look at, it's probably 82 to 84 percent don't have a shockable rhythm. Or maybe it's actually 47 percent don't have a shockable rhythm. We don't really know. Again, it depends on who's doing the study and what group of kids you're looking at. The idea is, and by the way, what is it in adults? It's about 25% shockable rhythm probably, and 25, 30% shockable rhythm, and then uh, the rest non-shockable rhythms. So is it really that big a difference from an adult? Maybe not, who cares? Um, <clears throat> the important thing is that kids tend to not have bad little tickers. Adults tend to have bad little tickers, and they go into arrhythmias and stuff, and that's the thing we can kind of fix with CPR. And so we approach it from this a, a CAB approach, where we're going to do compressions first and like squeeze that, and then we'll worry about the airway and the breathing somewhere along the way there. When you look at, uh, at Charlie here, you know, if he goes into a rest, what's the, probably the reason for it? It could be that he choked on a piece of hot dog or he's got something else, or it could be that his you know, brother jumped on him and knocked him into the pool or something like that, or he fell out of his swimmy. The reason that he arrests is probably not because he had a fatal cardiac dysrhythmia, possible, but not very common in a kid. So almost all the time, this is usually going to be probably some sort of airway or breathing issue. And so maybe when we're resuscitating kids, we should focus more on the airway and breathing um, than on the compression itself. Now, all of it is important. You've got to do all of it, yes. But uh, what that lends us to is should we be doing the airway and breathing maybe a little bit differently? Which led to this big debate about whether or not we should be bagging these kids at 10 to 12 breaths per minute or 20 to 30 breaths per minute as the new recommendation sort of goes. Now, the arguments are the following. From the old school guys who say 10 to 12. Well, you're basing this uh, that you're saying here, this big change, you're basing this on a single in hospital study and that isn't what we see in the field uh, so stop making recommendations on this there's no evidence to say that, that actually makes a difference uh, and then the guys that say put it at 20 to 30 say well at least I'm basing it on a study compared to what you got which is nothing so which one is right by the way that study itself um, was based on in hospital arrests of kids and they looked at who survived better depending on your ventilation rate uh, and it seemed like between 30 and 40 in, uh, in little kids under a year old or somewhere around upper 20s to 30 seemed to have the best survival, you know, hit the top of that curve um, <clears throat> better. Now, when you look at the area under the curve and the receiver operating stuff up here, this actually, you may not know anything about this, but this isn't a real good test, uh, real significant it looks to me. This may be a little so. Um, <clears throat> But it does make sense to me that we should probably bag these kids not at 10 to 12, because kids don't breathe 10 to 12 times a minute. They, you know, they breathe 20, 30 times a minute. And it probably was some kind of airway thing. So yes, I think we should pay more attention to it. I think we should bag them. I don't know if 30 is the right answer, but I do believe that 10 to 12 breaths per minute is probably pretty low. And Believe me, there is something going on with our lungs. And I think it's even more pronounced in kids that we're not appreciating cardiac arrest. And we talk about that some other time. All right, whatever you do, do good airway. Don't screw it up. 
And if the best you can do, and the best that many of us can do, is just bag the kid, that's perfectly fine. That's great. You can maintain a kid uh, by bagging them. That's, that's good. There's no reason that you have to put an ET tube in. You don't get an award for it. You shouldn't get an award for it. Don't feel a lot of pressure to do that kind of stuff. Whatever you're going to do, do it well. We talk a little bit about, uh, by the way, we'll talk just a touch about intubating these kids. Everybody makes mention, oh, they've got the different shaped airway and, and uh, they've got other stuff. What does that actually translate to me? What does that make different to me about whether or not he's got a funnel-shaped glottis or a, a regular shaped glottis? Uh, who cares? What do I do differently with the blade? The big thing to remember is that kids have little tiny mouths, little tiny airways, and if you stick a laryngoscope blade in their mouth, you've probably gone too deep already. When you approach their airway, you have to go in a very coordinated fashion. So you don't just like stick the blade in, hope you get the glottis like you might in an adult, and you shouldn't do that in an adult. But in a kid, you start at the tongue, and you find the tongue first. Literally, find the tongue. Then find the back of the tongue. Then look a little bit deeper in there. We're going slow, and we find the epiglottis, which is usually sitting right there. Again, if you haven't found the back of the tongue, you've probably gone past the epiglottis. So you find the back of the tongue, you find the epiglottis right there. If you're using a straight blade, a Miller blade, you grab the epiglottis and lift up. If you're using a Mac, which is also fine, then put it in the molecular behind it. <clears throat> lift up to expose the structures. And again, what's, how far you are lifting? Like that. Little tiny bits. Bits, little tiny bits. Um, <clears throat> you're going to lift to expose. You're going to say, oh, thank God. I've got a great view. I can easily get a tube in there. That, yes, you can get a view pretty easily in a kid, um, but the problem then becomes tube delivery. And that's one of the reasons why it's probably not a great idea to intubate all these kids or try to intubate these kids, because the tube delivery itself, the tube is basically as big as the mouth or close to it. It obscures your view. You won't be able to see very well once you get a tube in this little, you know, in that hole there. Literally, it'll block it like that, and you'll have no idea where you're going. It's really hard to intubate a kid. Um, <clears throat> and so, realistically, consider not intubating them. Ask yourself, do I really, really, really need to actually put an ET tube in this guy? Because there's no demonstrated advantage to intubation. My airway, nah, my airway algorithm in a child is going to go something like this. BVM, 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 uh, superglottic airway. If that doesn't work, BVM, BVM. And I'm probably going to say that most people should stay away from intubating them. And I'm not a great pediatric intubator anymore. As I've kind of mentioned before, it's been a while. I didn't get that many of them to start off with, even when, again, I was working in a PZD. I would feel more comfortable with pretty much everybody out there and myself probably. Let's just put in the thing that goes without us having to have a whole lot of skill or let's just bag, which is a skill that we have, and let's take them to the hospital and we'll do it in a more controlled environment. Intubating kids is hard and we should really consider whether or not that is a thing that is beneficial and we got to get over our ego like, oh, I can get a tube. Eh, eh. I don't know about that. Consider not intubating uh, most of these kids if you have any other choice. The other thing that's hard in kids is IVs because they got little tiny veins, right? I mean, not all of them. Uh, when you look at my kiddos here, one of them, uh, like me, I look at my forearm and, you know, I don't really see a whole lot there. They can usually find it okay. Henry over here, he's got these huge veins going through his AC that, you know, you could probably put a 14 in. Don't put a 14 in gauge in my kid. Uh, but you could do it. <clears throat> But not every kid's like this. And if you got an arm more like Paul here, uh, I just don't see a whole awful lot to stick. And I'm not that great an IV stick to start off with. The thing that Paul has lots of, though, is bones. He's got a ton of bones out there, and I could easily get into one of those guys. So um, as a result of this horrifying picture here, you can see all the different places that you might choose to place an IO in, uh, in maybe a child. Now, they have uh, proximal humerus listed up here as well. I would probably not do that in a child. And the reason for that, you, you can kind of make it work sometimes. But, you know, you look at a shoulder X around a child uh, that size, and you notice they really don't have a lot of bone up here. Now, there is stuff here. It's all just kind of cartilage, though. It's not ossified yet. It would probably be better not to drill into that. You could do it. There is 
you know, down here there is a bit of um, <clears throat> marrow that you can get into, but it's really not like a great plan. There are much better choices, much, much, much better. Everybody kind of thinks, let's go proximal tibia, right? Because you got some space here, but remember that little bone too is kind of small. It's maybe only that big. There's, there's not that much, and it is super common to get a pre-hospital I.O. that's gone through the backside that nobody realized went through the backside and you haven't done a damn thing uh, with it. What is probably easier is instead to go with this guy, the much bigger, biggest bone in our body, go with distal femur. And distal femur has actually become the preferred site for pediatric IV access. Now again, everybody likes proximal tibia because we're pretty comfortable with it and we feel like we know where it goes, you know, just kind of right in there. But again, not our best spot. What we could do is go distal femur. How do you do it? You find the kneecap, you go above the kneecap, you know, as long as you're not going through the kneecap itself, through the patella, it's probably okay. But just go a little bit above the kneecap. In this case, I did like a finger breath or something like that. And then on the medial side uh, and angle it towards the center just a bit. Now, this is a big old bone with a big old marrow cavity, and it's pretty easy to hit. We tend not to do it in adults, and we don't get a lot of practice because adults have, you know, lots of soft tissue and flub over their distal femur, uh, like uh, muscle and, and fat and that kind of stuff. And it's hard in an adult, but in a kid, you can easily do it. You may need to use that yellow adult needle, depending on how much uh, quad, you know, stuff there is there, but in kids, this is a great site for IO access. Something to bear in mind, you can do an IO in an awake child or in a seizing child or something like that, in a hypoglycemic child. If you've got to get access, don't waste your time trying to like fiddle around hurting them with an IV. Just put in an IO. And yes, it'll be a little bit uncomfortable when you drill it in. If you really want to make a kid mad though, you really want to provide noxious stimulus, flush that thing and you'll see this kid really come out. If there's anything in there, he's going to wake up when you flush that sucker, which you absolutely have to. Now, you shouldn't do that in an awake kid. That's, that hurts a lot. So what can you do about it? If you have an awake child and you want to give something through the IO, what you should do is instill some lidocaine first. In adults, if you've heard me talk about this, we use the 2-2-2 method. So we're going to take lidocaine. We're going to take 2 milliliters of 2% lidocaine, which is the cardiac arrest stuff. 2 milliliters, 2% lidocaine. I'm going to slowly, after I put in the IO before I flush it, I'm going to slowly push it in over about 2 minutes. And that's, again, pretty slow because I'm not going to do a whole awful lot. I'm going to push it in over two minutes, and then I'm going to let it sit for two minutes. This is not the fastest thing in the world. Take it easy. It's all right. <clears throat> so again, two milliliter, adults, two milliliters of lidocaine, 2% lidocaine, over two minutes, and then I'm going to let it sit for two minutes. And then I might give another half dose after that. What are you doing, kids? Of course, everything's weight-based. It's a pain in the butt. But give the easiest way I can simplify this, give one over two milligrams per kilogram of 2% lidocaine over two minutes, let it dwell for two minutes. And you're just going to have to figure out, based on your dosing, what uh, <clears throat> you know a half milligram per kilogram looks like. Spoiler, it's probably going to be under two milliliters. So if you think like your calculation is, I'm going to give five milliliters, you've gone someplace wrong with that. But figure out a half milligram per kilogram and then give that over uh, two minutes and let it sit for two minutes, and then maybe give a half dose of that uh, afterwards again, because you don't want to hurt the kid if, if you can all avoid it. But this will provide really good pain relief, and it'll let you infuse stuff through an I.O., uh, and let you flush the I.O. without causing the kid, you know, terrible, terrible pain. Last thing I would like to mention is that with kids, but also with adults, there are often other adults that accompany them. Small adults often have very concerned adults responsible for their welfare with them. And that's truly not a lot different than like, again, our elderly population, which have family members with them, which have kids with them, uh, folks that are very concerned about them and are very scared, possibly, likely even more so than the patient is themselves. So consider assigning somebody to the family, especially if the child is really bad off. If the kid's just got like a broken arm and he's chilling out and you just put him in a splint and they're going to ride to the hospital, okay. 
But if this is an arrest, if this is a kid that's not doing well, if this is a kid that looks really sick, like bad anaphylactic reaction, mom, dad, grandma, whoever's with him, uh, they're going to be really, really upset. And that can make your life a whole lot worse. So if you have the resources available, try to dedicate this kid, try to dedicate somebody to this kid's loved ones. Somebody to s explain what's kind of going on and make sure, because otherwise all you do is see somebody doing stuff to your kid and that's a really, you know, discomforting way to be. And that raises a lot of the temperature in the room and it's not that great. So if you can, assign somebody to be with this kid's family uh, so that they can keep calm and help you keep him calm at the same time. And that's what we got on small adults. I thank you for your attention.